Welcome to Smart Catalyst number 20, 2018. So today we are going to see all these articles. The first one is Maldives set to pull out of China the free trade deal. The second one is talks on with 150 nations to reform WTO. The third one is places in recent news. And the fourth article is lynching data to be compiled separately in database from this year onwards and the fifth one is an ailing mission to clean river ganga the first article is maldives set to pull out of china free trade deal so what the news here is the maldives new government is trying to pull out of the free trade agreement with china but this free trade agreement with china was signed by the former president during a visit to beijing in december last year and this was signed without any kind of discussions or debate and now they are trying to that is the new government is trying to pull out of that free trade deal with china so why means because of the huge trade imbalance between the china and maldives so if you see maldives has no such free trade pacts with any of the other countries but Maldives is one among the countries where the China has invested billions of dollars such as by means of doing building highways building infrastructure as well as including all those smaller smaller countries into a part of BRI which is the Belt Road Initiative of the China so by means of doing all these kind of initiatives China actually is trying to increase the trade as well as the investment flows with much of the Asia as well as the other parts of the rest of the world. So what the critics are saying here is these kind of China led infrastructure projects left tiny countries like the Maltese which is having very less than 4 lakh population to debt Britain and already China is doing lot of infrastructure projects in Maltese and apart from this this kind of free trade agreement between Maltese and China would only make this situation even worse for Maltese. So they are stating it by saying the mistake for the tiny nation like the Maltese to strike such a free trade pact with the world's second biggest economy which is the China and if you see it is a one-way treaty that means China is exporting more to Maldives and it is importing very very less from Maldives in terms of like 342 million imports from China to Maldives and only this much to China from Maldives so this kind of forced Deb Britain by means of trade between Maldives and China is making Maldives even more financially difficult and in order to tackle that financially difficult situation only the, now the new Maldivian government is trying to pull out from this free trade agreement. So the second article is talks on with 150 nations to reform WTO. So what the news here is the multilateral trading system which is the WTO is now under stress and in order to tackle that the commerce minister of india was in talks with 150 countries of wto in order to find some new mechanisms to reform the wto so why they want to reform the wto means because of recently emerging or recently happening trade war as well as the restrictive trade practices which is followed by all the developed countries all over the world so these things actually make or shows the protectionism attitude of each and every country so if you see in case of us it is like the trump's recent rounds of tariffs over the imports of other countries products is clearly violating the wto rules because wto actually aims wto actually aims to promote the global trading system in a fair way so the global trading system should be fair. Th this is what the aim of WTO. So as per WTO, free trade among the countries should be ensured. So this is what the aim of WTO. But Trump's this kind of tariff is violating the WTO norms as well as China's made in China 2025. So the recent allegation over China by US is like the trade practices whatever followed by China is actually opaque. And China is also giving lot of trade distorting subsidies for high tech products as well as lot of things which is followed by China. So these are all the things which indicate that these kind of developed countries are actually moving away from the WTO practices that is instead of following the global open trading system they are now becoming more and more restrictive as well as more and more closed system. 
So in this kind of situation, WTO reform is very necessary for fostering a fair global trading practice all among the countries. So the next article is Places in Recent News. So what the news here is, as a part of bilateral meet between India and Vietnam, our president has actually visited this Maison temple in Vietnam. So in that context, we have to know about this Maison temple. So it is a cluster of abandoned and partially ruined old Hindu temple in Vietnam and it was constructed during the period of 4th and 14th century by the kings of Champa in Vietnam. So these temples are dedicated to the worship of God Shiva who is popularly known as Badreshwara in that region and if you see in prelims perspective this Maison temple is a UNESCO World Heritage Site and it is renovated recently with the help of Archaeological Survey of India. So now we are going to see some places in map. So if you see in this picture, it is Vietnam. And it is surrounded by the Pacific Ocean and Cambodia, Laos and China at the top. Okay? And if you see, there are two gulfs. One is Gulf of Tonkin and another one is Gulf of Thailand, below Thailand. And here it is Mekong River. It is actually originated from China and it flows through Laos and reaches Thailand and finally it enters into Cambodia and drains into Pacific Ocean. So the next article is lynching data to be compiled separately in NCRB reports from this year onwards. So what the news here is the Ministry of Home Affairs is going to release this National Crime Records Bureau report of 2017 in the coming days and in that report they are actually planning to document this lynching incident separately. So why they are doing this in the sense because recently there are a lot of lynching incidents that is prevalent in our country and in order to tackle that only our government is trying to bring the lynching as a crime. So now lynching is a crime under the crime bureau and under that only the lynching records are have to be updated okay. So this was proposed by Rajiv Gauba committee okay. So why they are doing this in the sense this kind of separation of lynching database will lead to better identification of the cases and investigation of the cases and proper accountability of the cases thereby we can increase the efficiency of the entire process and we can ensure the speedy justice. So the next article is an ailing mission to clean river Ganga. So we all know that the government has been taken various steps in order to regenerate as well as to clean river Ganga from the past. One such project is Namami Gange project after gap 1 and gap 2 which is the Ganga action plan 1 and gap 2. So it is a follow up okay. But there are certain concerns in this Namami Ganga project. One is the first major concern here is less than 25% of the project have been completed till now and only 20% of the funds allocated for that is utilized till now and even the tendering process of one fourth of the project is not yet completed. Out of 114 projects only 27 projects sanctioned in the five states were completed till now. So these all indicates the lethargic approach of both the central government as well as the state government. So now if you see in this picture it is River Ganga and it stretches over five states. The longest stretch is in Uttar Pradesh and the least stretch is in Jharkhand. So first is Uttar Pradesh, second one is West Bengal, third Bihar and fourth Uttarakhand and fifth one is Jharkhand. So now what is the way forward here is even though the planning and all is good, the implementation by the central as well as the state government is actually lagging. So the government should focus on improving the speed of the process as well as the sanctioning of the projects. So now we are going to discuss the main articles. The first one is doing business which aim to make India in the top 25 by 2022. The second one is RBI way scheme to recast MSME loans. The third one is easing the government's infrastructure burden. And the fourth one is government RBI call truce after a marathon board meeting. And fifth one is literacy level in rural India suffers due to migration. So the next article is doing business aim must be to scale top 25 by 2022. So what the news here is India is having a good possibility of being ranked below 50 in the ease of doing business which is published by World Bank. So if you see our past rank it is like from 130 we climbed to 100 and then we have climbed to 77th rank in 2018. So we are one among the top 10 gainers for two years in a row which indicates our willingness or our country's willingness for taking the reforms. So what are the reforms which were taken by the government previously in order to get into this top rank in the sense. So the first major initiative by our government is GST which is the tax restructuring mechanism which 
showcase our efficiency all over the country and the second major initiative by our government is in terms of construction permit where we have improved in lot in the ranking and the third one is getting electricity and the fourth one is protecting minority investors so in all these things our country is improved a lot but in terms of registering property alone we actually declining or we are lagging so india is now top ranked among eight south asian countries okay so what is the immediate aim means we have to get into the top 50 rank by 2020 and in the long run we have to achieve the rank below 25 that means by 2022 okay so what we have to do in order to achieve this in the sense first one is to remove the roadblocks in gst we have to make the gst process much more easier so the second one is adr which is the alternative dispute resolution okay so it is there in order to provide solutions for the disputes of business entities mainly business entities so the government has already worked on legislations to improvise this adr so adr was actually introduced in order to alleviate the concerns with commercial contract but now it is lagging a little bit so we have to tackle that also in order to increase the or increase the efficiency of the dispute resolution mechanism the next major reform would be like land registration process that is we have to make it much more efficient we have to introduce digitalization of the records in terms of land registration and those kind of reforms should be an integrated and usable platform so that exchange of information would be very easier so recently states are also ranked on the basis of ease of doing business separately by niti io so these kind of ranking would also increase the competitive spirit among the states thereby the states would take their reforms more seriously okay so what is the conclusion here is working on these reforms is very much essential to keep up the promise of service resta bharat which is the aim of our country by 2047 okay so these are some of the parameters on which the ease of doing business is calculated by World Bank. So the next article is government RBA call truths after a marathon board meeting. So what the news here is the RBA and the government agreeing to settle for a middle ground at the end of an over nine hour board meeting on Monday. Yesterday RBA board meeting was held and in that the RBA and the government came to a conclusion in certain scenarios and leaving certain other scenarios as it is. So now we are going to see all those things. So the major issue between government and RBA is revolving around the RBI's capital. The government is actually eyeing on the RBI's capital and it wants certain part of the capital to be transferred to the government in order to meet the fiscal deficit of the economy. So apart from that, the tension between the RBI and the government was started with the government actually referring to the section 7 of the RBI Act of 1934, the government is actually threatening RBI that it invokes the section 7 of RBI Act if in case to deal with these kind of issues. So it is a major concern, right? And for that only, this recent board meeting was actually expected more. So this meeting actually proceeded well contrary to the expectation. So after the board meeting, the RBI actually decided to make concession on two major things. One is about the capital adequacy ratio and second one is about the transfer of surplus reserves from RBI to the government and also relaxing the norms for weaker banks. So what the RBI actually decided is after the meet, the RBI has agreed to setting up of an expert committee and this expert committee is going to do two major things. One is they are going to look about the transfer of the surplus reserves from RBI to government and second one is about the relaxing norms for weaker banks the anything about these two things are not decided by the rbi board meeting yesterday and rather it is transferred to the expert committee which was constituted by the rbi and now they are only going to look about these two matters and one more thing you have to note here the membership and the terms of reference of such expert committee will be decided by both the government as well as the rbi together and the next major decision which was taken is about the prompt corrective action so the board for financial supervision so this board is under RBA actually. So they review the norms and net non-performing asserts of the banks and they also relaxed the prompt corrective action framework so that some of the banks come out of PCA that is the prompt corrective action. So if you see 
nearly 11 out of the 21 banks that is 11 public sector banks are on PCA or on prompt corrective action so by relaxing the prompt corrective action norms we can easily get these banks out of the PCA as well as they can lend more to the consumers and the fourth major decision is about the capital adequacy ratio and as per the Basel norm 3 the capital adequacy ratio of any bank should be maintained at least 8 percentage but our as per our RBI rules this should be at least 9 percentage for scheduled commercial banks and for public sector banks it is like 12 percentage okay so it is way more than the basal norms ratio of 8 percentage so this is also mentioned in the same meeting and they want to maintain the level of 8 percentage but they finally concluded to retain the car at 9 percentage itself so these are some of the decisions taken by the rbi and government in the board meeting the one is the capital norms ratio is retained at 9 percentage the second one is relaxing of the pca of 11 psbs and third one is easier credit for msmes so msmes are the sectors which is majorly hit by the demonetization and the gst so in order to recover that we have to give more credit to msme so that is also uh, decided in that meet and the fourth one is regarding the transfer of the rbi's reserve to government to tackle the fiscal deficit and the fifth one is special liquidity windows for nbfcs Okay. So, these are actually now facing liquidity crunch. So, in order to tackle that, they have to give more liquidity. And the last thing that they discussed is about fixing the issues of governance inside RBI. So, among all these things, only four things are desired and two things are left undesired. So, the major decision here is setting up of expert committee to review the economic capital framework of RBI. So what is this economical capital framework of RBI? Now we are going to see that. So now we are going to see what is this economical capital framework of RBI. So it means it is a framework on calculating the minimum capital which is required by the RBI. So it is the minimum capital which is required by the RBI. So this much amount of money that the RBI should have with it. That is what this economic capital framework. So if you fix certain amount like X percentage should be the ECF means then the remaining surplus will be automatically transferred to the government right. So that is what actually decided by the expert committee. So they are going to decide this ECF and after the fixation of certain percentage, the minimum capital, then the remaining surplus will be transferred to the government. So this is what they decided by means of this RBI board meet. Okay. So these two things, the major concern here is the liquidity crisis of NBFCs as well as the issues in the governance of RBI are left undesired after this meet. So the next article is RBI ways scheme to recast MSME loans. So what the news here is our Indian banking system is suffering from lot of NPAs which are the non-performing asserts. So if you see who is the major contributor for this NPA then it is obviously MSME sectors. So in order to make the MSME sector more stable now the RBI is trying to consider a scheme for restructuring of the stressed asserts of those MSME sectors which is having a loans of up to 25 crore. So if any MSME sector is having a loan of less than 25 crore or up to 25 crore then the RB is trying to restructure their stressed asserts okay in order to help them to overcome the NPAs or in order to tackle the NPA situation. So why they actually chosen MSME in the sense because this is the sector which is badly hit due to the twin blows of demonetization as well as the GST implementation. So this sector is severely affected after these two things and in order to ensure the financial stability in these MSME sector only now RBI is actually advised to restructure the stress deserts. But what is the concern over here in the sense the NBFCs which are the non-banking financial sectors who are giving loans to MSMEs to a larger extent they are now having liquidity crunch they are having not enough liquidity to give loan to the MSME sector so we have to tackle that first then only we have to restructure this MSME so this is a major concern right and nearly 9 lakh MSMEs have closed down over the last couple of years due to the demonetization and GST alone so these indicates the severeness of the NPAs and its impact in MSME sector so in order to tackle that only now the restructuring is going to be done by RBI so these are the SMEs and their contribution percentage okay so as we know that these msmes are one of the major contributor to our gdp 
if the liquidity crisis as well as these kind of non performing assets in these msmes are not resolved as soon as possible then these kind of small companies will never graduate into a larger companies so we have to focus on that as soon as possible so the next article is easing the government's infrastructure burden so this article talks about how the government's infrastructure project or the public institutions infrastructure projects are incapacitated and how we have to tackle or how we have to reform these infrastructure projects okay so the first major thing you have to note here is the private sector alone contributed nearly one third of the infrastructure projects so the investment done for the infrastructure project in that one third is contributed by the private sector alone and the author is suggesting like we have to increase it further more so that the government's infrastructure burden is getting lowered and the second major concern here is the renewable energy sector which have seen brisk investment before is facing headwinds today so before it is like more prosperous but now it is lagging so that is what they mentioned so we have to look into that also but the one thing to be noted here is the national highways project it is going good among the government project the national highways project is going good only because of the restructuring or the involvement of the private in it by means of hybrid annuity model so now we are going to see what is this hybrid annuity model so it is a ppp model which is the public private partnership model and in that both the government as well as the private will be there and during the initial stage of the project the private is like bringing 60% of the investment or the capital what it needs and the government is giving 40% okay so and they started the project and they concluded the project also and after that the government through the national highways authority of india will pay the remaining 60% whatever it has to give to the private through concession per uh, by means of annuity for each and every year it is paying the remaining 60% so this is what the basis or how it works so the private player during the construction of the infrastructure it is responsible for the operation and maintenance and after that it will be transferred to the government what is the way forward here is even though the broad based private investment in infrastructure is there but it needs relentless commitment from both central as well as the state government in order to make the project even more successful and the public institutions like the city governments power utilities as well as the bus transport corporations they are now very incapacitated and they need to be the epicenter or focus of the transformation effort so these items need to be reformed first so this is what stated by the author and the ppp model which is so far successful in terms of the road construction and infrastructure projects and all it should be implemented all over and you should expedite more ppp model in all all sorts of infrastructure projects and it is recommended by kelkar committee so as per kelkar committee this ppp model should be leveraged even more and the last one is reviving the stalling private investment that means whatever the project which are stalled that is also needs to be resumed and we have to accelerate the infrastructure that is what as of now india needs so the last article is literacy levels in rural india suffer due to migration it is found by unesco study so what this article talks about is it is talking about the educational challenges which is thrown by means of migration so due to migration what are the educational challenges faced by the rural children okay so the news here is the unesco global education monitoring report 2019 recently released a report and in that they stated like the literacy level in rural households of india is dip or uh, getting lowered with seasonal migration so what is this seasonal migration means we all know that due to the economical reasons like employment opportunities as well as the social reasons like poverty people are usually migrated from one place to another place for their employment as well as for their livelihood so this is what they called as seasonal migration and due to this seasonal migration the literacy level of the migrated population or the migrated children are now getting very much lowered so this is what su suggested in that report and also nearly 80% of the seasonal migrant children in seven cities lack the access to education basic education is itself is a question to these 80% of the migrant children and among the 80% nearly 40% or end up in working or experiencing abuse as well as the exploitation by means of taking up various kinds of job in the destination region and 10.7 million children who are in the age of 6 to 14 they are also lived in rural household with a seasonal migrant it is in 2013 and one more major concern over here is nearly 28% of the youth who are aged between 15 to 19 
in these rural households were illiterate and hadn't completed even the primary school compared to the 18% of the similar cohort. And one more thing we have to note here is after the seasonal migration, the migrant people or the migrant children are mostly observed by the construction sector. They are involving in the construction activities and nearly 60% of those construction migrants are interstate migrants. They are from one state to another state within the country and this interstate migration alone, that rate alone gets doubled between 2001 to 2011 and it become increased to 9 million from the period of 2011 to 2016. So it shows how much uh, intensified it is, okay? And one more uh, thing here is, even if the parents are migrating, not the children, but the education of the children is having a negative impact. So that is also suggested by the report. So how to address all these issues? The report itself stated that amongst all these issues, the central government as well as the state government is taking a lot of steps. And one among the steps is this Right to Education Act, which makes it mandatory for the local authorities to admit the migrant children into the school. And the second major initiative by the government is national level guidelines for making the admission of children flexible and providing the migrant children the transport as well as the mobile education for them in an easier way. And apart from that, the state government has also have taken a lot of steps to encourage the migrant children education. So even though all these things exist, it is still a major concern, right? So we have to address that. So these are some of the state government initiative for the migrant children education. So even though the government has taken a lot of steps from the past, there are certain concerns like the teacher and the student absenteeism is getting very much increased. Thereby, the out of school children is also getting increased and the growth of slums and informal settlements is getting increased where the schools are often scarce so if schools are not there then that is a place where the slums and informal settlements are getting increased so it is a concern right so if you see in terms of india there is only one urban planner for every one lakh people but it is not like the same case in united kingdom they are having like 38 planners for every one lakh people so it shows the difference right so we have to face we have to address all these concerns and we have to ensure the proper education health as well as the standard of living to these migrant population also so that is what stated by the author in this article thank you